The gentleman's name is Neil Sperling. And I'm going to read Neil's bio because it's just, there's lots of detail in it. And I want to make sure I don't miss any piece of it. Neil's also going to come up with our amazing James Buchan, who's one of our facilitators at Make Your Mark, because, which is really cool. And James is, going to, James is going to really support Neil. They have a, a process that they've been both been practicing, and Neil, and Neil wants him to uh, just ask questions or what have you. So after I've read the bio, we'll then do a huge Make Your Mark family welcome to Neil, and then, of course, to our very own Mr. James Buchan as well. Neil Sperling is the founder and CEO of a global business strategic advisory service that has advised startups, mid-cap companies, non-profits, to very high net worth individuals. Neil has strategized and helped his clients solve often extremely complex and difficult business challenges and then connected them to individuals who have changed their lives for the better and has even helped them to fulfill their unique life's purpose. Hence, he's been called a world-class problem solver and a world-class connector. He's done some amazing connections for me already and I'm so super blessed. At last count, Neil has connected with over 50 billionaires, the President of the United States, U.S. Vice President, various heads of state, prime ministers, a five-star military general, governors, mayors, Academy Award-winning actors, directors, producers, and 15 Nobel laureates, including nine Nobel Peace Prize winners. Recently, Neil developed a series of masterminds to reveal a number of relatively simple techniques that can help anyone to think more abundantly. How many like to think more abundantly? That was really freaking convincing. <laughs> How many like to think more abundantly? <laughs> Beautiful. It's like, no, I'd rather just think crappy. <laughs> so I can laugh. Uh, to think more abundantly, more, more, uh, more efficiently, and more successfully to become super competitive. Super, crea uh, super creativity aims to teach anyone how to break down, understand, and replicate the thinking processes, pathways, and approaches consistently used by history's most innovative, successful thinkers. From Da Vinci, Edison, Einstein, Tesla, Buckminster Fuller, Stephen Jobs, and Elon Musk. How many of you like to think like those people? Yeah. Okay. Well, you're in for a treat. You're in for a super treat. The variety of approaches to innovation and problem solving Neil has made Sorry, the variety of approaches to innovation and problem solving, Neil has made it his business to research, study, and replicate, uh, and replicate. <laughs> and, re and replicate can help those facing common challenges in their everyday businesses, uh, business, in their everyday business, professional, and even personal lives to more efficiently identify and resolve problems, up-level their thinking skills and abilities, achieve greater confidence, and ultimately leapfrog ahead of virtually any competitor by looking at most any future challenges faced through the above expanded eyes of genius. <laughs> you're, gonna be, this is, you're in for a super treat. I remember meeting Neil. I was on the phone with him. I was up at um, Sparkling Hills Resort. And I was on the phone with him, and we had such a great call together. And he said to me, Colin, I'd, I said to him, Neil, I'd love you to be on our stage. He said, I'd love to come grace your audience with my brilliance. This man has a very different... <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> to, to come and grace our audience with his brilliance, which is really, really awesome, because he is one of the most creative thinkers, most amazing human beings, and he's here because he's heart-centered as well and cannot wait to serve you. So I'd like you to get onto your feet, please, as we may welcome Neil Sperling and his assistant, James Buchan, to the stage. Let's give a huge round of applause. about him. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very, very much. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. I love your energy. I feed on energy. Your energy feeds me. So thank you for that very warm, gracious welcome. Um, the reason your energy feeds me is because we are in a reciprocal energy feeding relationship. All of us are. 
Uh, I'm known now, I guess, as a connector because it took me many, 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 many years to discover my purpose. My passion is my purpose. My purpose is my passion. Didn't come to me right away. Um, I learned that uh, basically, uh, do I have my clicker? Could you go, could, could you be kind enough? <laughs> That's on the stand. Where? Oh my gosh, okay, thank you. I'm not that great of you. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. See, Th this is why ingenious people need ingenious people, right? Okay. None of us are perfect. And actually, that is a theme of my life. Um, when I started out, I'd like to tell people that I've made every mistake in the book twice. The reason I made every mistake in the book twice was to make sure that the first time I was making that mistake, I was making it correctly. <laughs> and I did, and did, and did. Um, but I learned. Uh, you know that old saying about, uh, if, if you're going to keep replicating your mistakes, where that leads, right? Um, you know, uh, so, so anyway, um, I, uh, I think I started out in the world pretty much like everybody else. I was born into a world of strange and mysterious giants that were constantly harassing me and would not leave me alone. I begged them to leave me alone. They would not do that. And I'm very glad because I had some wonderful support of parents. I truly believe if ultimately you're going to achieve, you need support. And I was blessed in that regard as I grew older. Um, so much so that my parents encouraged me to try everything, to find my place and my purpose in life. So I think I went through just about every career ideation one can think of. And what I found was I was a misfit. I was not good at a lot of things. Um, some of you may have found your passion or your purpose early on, but that was not me. So I went through a lot of trial and error in my life. And as it happens, I had the same ambitions that probably everyone in this room had, which was to climb the highest mountain and achieve great things in life. As it happened, I never did at this point. I actually hoped to someday climb the Everest of, of you know, my ambitions, and I wound up probably at 8,700 feet at Half Dome in Yosemite National Park. Not Mount Everest at this stage of my life. Um, but I went on, and like a lot of you, I got odd jobs to pay my way through school. That actually is a representation of my first job at Arby's. And even at that young age, I had a sense that things had an organizational flow and people were more successful and less successful depending on how they organized their approaches to things and had various systems. So the earliest uh, intuition I had about having a successful system at this stage in working in fast food was that people would be happy when they bought their fast food and if they were happy, they'd eat more food. So I decided to make people happy when they ordered their burgers. And without any coaching, without any real training the first day on the job, I had somebody who came up to me and said, is this beef safe to eat? And I instantly decided to answer him in the affirmative and truthfully. And I told him, sir, this beef is not only safe, it is the safest beef in the world. The reason it is the safest beef in the world is all of our beef comes straight from the middle of Mexico. And in the middle of Mexico, they have a very special and rare cactus. And they only flower for two weeks of the year. And when this flower comes up, it's filled with this aphrodisiac quality, and the cattle eat it. And they get so excited, they lose all sensibilities, and they start running around the desert for three days without any let up. And by time they're slaughtered, they are so lean that this lean beef is the secret behind Arby's success. And he laughed, and he enjoyed himself, and he bought more burgers. <laughs> My manager didn't buy that at all and fired me at the end of the day. <laughs> True story. Um, so what does one do? I, I had to get another job pretty quickly. I landed at the May Company in their betting department. Now, my job, this second job that I had, was basically every time people came to the bedding department and wanted to lay on the bed and the mattress and see what it felt like was to clean up the mess at the end of the day and straighten out all the bedding so it's perfect for the next day. 
I thought that was too labor intensive a job and there was a better system. So I actually took pictures of the bedding when it was messed up as well as the bedding when it was perfect. Because when people came to the bedding department, they didn't bring their cameras. And they also couldn't measure or see how this would look in their, or visualize how this would look in their, their bedrooms. So I had the before and after picture and I encouraged them not to sit on the beds and mess it up because I just simplified it and here are the pictures, <laughs> right? And, and to me it made a lot of sense and it saved me a lot of extra work and I was fired at the end of the day. <laughs> so needless to say, I wasn't starting out with a lot of success in my life. And what do you do when that happens? You join the army, <laughs> right? Because they're paying you and you don't have to think a lot. So the Army, in its infinite wisdom, assigned me to Fort Knox, and there you see a picture of me guarding Fort Knox. You'll notice a few things if you have a discriminating and practice eye. I am one person guarding Fort Knox. I am not the biggest person guarding Fort Knox. And I don't have a gun, <laughs> right? So essentially, this is why, for all of you in Canada, you're curious about why America is having its financial difficulties today. <laughs> Military intelligence is the explanation. Interestingly enough, um, when I was in the military, I was asked what I wanted to do and what aspect or branch I wanted to go into. And I thought, you know, it sounds like it'd be fun. I'd like to explore military intelligence. And I asked about that. I had the steel pot on my head. When I was born, I had a slight hearing deficiency. My left ear, it's a nerve deafness. It's incorrectable. And because of that, I have to always strain in conversation. With the steel pot on my head, I could barely hear people. So when I mentioned this to the drill sergeants, and they came back and said to me, Sperling. I said, what? And they said, I said, what? And they lift the pot up, and they say, intelligence, Sperling, military intelligence, you don't have it. <laughs> so actually, after about two months, they let me go. I wasn't dishonorably discharged, but they let me go. So naturally, I have to say, at this stage in my life, things were not really going well. <laughs> and I knew I needed to shape up, and I really didn't know, how do I do that? So interestingly enough, I started to reflect on my life and what I was good at, and I couldn't think of anything except, I remember when I was in high school at 15, they gave me a test. Most all the tests, like you, you could probably relate, I did okay. There's one test I did really, really exceptionally at. And it was confusing because they didn't give me the context of what it was measuring. How many of you have seen tests like this? Anybody want to raise your hands? Excellent, excellent. So um, this was a test to measure visual spatial relationships, the operative word being relationships and how things connect up. And for some reason, I did extraordinarily well. In fact, when I took this test, it was basically check the boxes. I was given half an hour, and I just check, 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 done. 15 minutes instead of the full 30. They came back to me, and they said, we think there's been a mistake. I said, why? And they said, well, you got all the questions right, and no one's ever done that before. And I said, OK, so what do you want me to do? And they said, well, we'd like to test you again to make sure that we didn't make a mistake. So I said, sure. And they gave me another version of this with different puzzles. And basically, it was the same thing for me. I looked at these relationships. Check, 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 done. And they came back, and I got a second 100%. And no one had ever done that before. And they didn't tell me what that meant. So for many years since I took that test, I didn't know what my real gift is or how to apply it. And I'm sure a lot of you may feel that way in your own lives. What's your passion and what's your purpose? Well, here's the interesting segue. Um, I decided at that point in my life that if I did so well on that test, maybe it would help to understand what my level of intellect was. So I had the chutzpah, as they say, to apply to Mensa to see what my level of intellect was. And maybe they could let me know just where I stood among other people. And I got the results back. I don't know if you could see it. And they said I was smart. I actually fell in the 94th percentile of people. But I wasn't a genius. I was a 137. Once again, I fell short, which was dispiriting. 
But because I had this curiosity and I'm able to connect up relationships and thinking and puzzle pieces, I started thinking about this and there was a really interesting paradox. Why is it that so many of my business heroes who I really admired and m many of whom, some of them are up there and there were many more, were all billionaires and had dropped out of school or had never finished school. Is getting a PhD the path road to success? Or is it something else? So I really wrestled with that paradox for a long time. And interestingly, it goes way back to up in the left-hand corner, uh, Andrew Carnegie, Orville Wright, who came up with the airplane, right? Never finished school. Walt Disney. Um, Henry Ford, who's not even up there, but modern geniuses that have dropped out, we would consider them geniuses, I think, like Steven Spielberg. But the one thing they all had in common, as I started to look at it, is they were very creative thinkers. They were looking at things outside the box. They were looking at how things related that we don't see. For example, Steven Spielberg, it's a fascinating story that when, if, how many of you have seen uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? A lot of you, excellent. So when Steven Spielberg was trying to figure out the design of the spaceship that comes down over everybody in, in Wyoming, he thought, you know, I have to make a visual statement here, and it's got to be like a wow factor. He drove up to the top of Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles, which has the San Fernando Valley spread out before him. And this is a true story. He actually got out of his car, and he stood on his head. And he looked at the valley below and all the lights, and he said, that's the bottom of my spaceship. Did they teach you that in school? But he made the connection. He saw how that could relate. So I started reading these stories, and I thought it was very interesting. And so I made it my own business to study genius, specifically creative genius, not academic genius, but that kind of quirky thing where people are making these discoveries by association, relationships. And I studied the great masters, and I decided I would go for broke and study the most creative thinkers I could think of in history, like da Vinci, Einstein, Tesla, Edison, Buckminster Fuller, and later Steve Jobs, and not at the time, but most recently Elon Musk, to see what they all had in common. And if there were path roads that they all followed, algorithmic approaches to thinking processes, that I could define, drill down, and turn into a formula that was easily reteachable in a blueprint. Now, there's a big challenge. I'd actually like to thank somebody who helped me to do that. She's actually here in the audience, and at one point we were talking, she's actually a, a, a really noted business consultant. Can we all just acknowledge Lisa Hubbard? She's sitting in the back. Lisa, could you stand up and take a bow? Thank you. I would not be up here today if it weren't for Lisa, because, you know, I, I've kind of got into a rhythm of doing these things. But uh, what was interesting is that Lisa said, Neil, you know, you're so creative, can you teach that? And I said, I don't know, it's such an amorphous, abstract concept, creativity. But that is essentially what led me on the path road to starting to quantify this and crystallize it, package it. So. Um, one of the things that was really interesting to me was looking at people who broke through supposedly barriers that could not be surmounted. Uh, Roger Bannister, as you most of you, how many know who Roger Bannister is? Great, excellent, fantastic. So Roger Bannister, of course, was the first man to break the four minute mile. This was not just an achievement, it was a super achievement, because at the time, people really believed it was physically, physiologically impossible for anybody to break four minutes. Just the human body could not do that. People came close, 359, nine, but not the four minute mile. So Roger Bannister was interesting to me because it wasn't as much even about his athletic performance, but the things that he did as well mentally that are really not that well known. In fact, I was just reading before uh, getting on stage uh, what other runners had to say about Bannister, and it was mostly about practice and execution. But it wasn't really about what I delved into, which is laying the foundation. And you can't put up the roof before you've at least laid the foundation, right? So what Bannister did is that he decided to look at other people who had run as fast as they could that were his competition and deduce what they were doing differently. 
And he noticed things. He noticed, for example, when you're running, there's some wasted motion. If you tuck in and get your center of gravity with your torso, you may save a quarter of a half a second. He noticed that when winners were running, if they kept their fingers together, it became like human knives slicing through the atmosphere. He noticed if people leaned forward off the starting blocks and when they did it and how they did it, it was all little things, not one big thing. And each of them were doing their little things, but they weren't doing the little things other people were doing. And so he basically combined all of this together in mental preparation to then do what everyone is focused on and all the runners that I've read have complimented on doing in terms of the practice and performance, the execution side. And it was interesting to me because it reminded me what I learned about uh, Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein did something that all of you in the room can do today. You can think like Albert Einstein in this one facet. Albert Einstein was known for spending 55 minutes on the problem and five minutes on the solution. Most of us, if you think about it, spend five minutes on the problem and 55 minutes to a lifetime trying to figure out a solution. Albert Einstein was focused on the foundation. And by getting really clear about the foundation, it led him to almost by connection to understand intuitively how to reach the solution. Now, Bannister didn't only follow a principle that Einstein followed. Uh, another thing that he did was to reverse engineer from where he wanted to be and all the little things that he needed to put together in his execution to get there. Tesla, the other genius that I showed you that I've studied, was very much like that and uh, coming up with his principles of sucking uh, electricity literally out of the universe was really about that goal of how did that happen and working his way back. And he also kind of combined all these things, which was what Steve Jobs was really noted for. Steve Jobs was an associative thinker where he could see globally and locally. Most of the people who work for him were very micro-focused. You know, we have an age of specialization. So they saw that one piece of the bigger whole. Jobs had the vision to understand that there is an entire tirity to things made up of little things. And by combining all of those things, you create a better system. So needless to say, by practicing all these facets, Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile by basically taking eight years to execute a job in four minutes. Think about that. Think about that. It's a really important point. Most everybody today wants to get to the bottom line. But you can't get to the bottom line without the proper preparation. And he was disciplined enough to see this. So it was very interesting. Um, as I started going through this, I started seeing that all great creative geniuses are systems thinkers. But they really understand the process of how you organize a system successfully. And those systems can be applied to anything. Because they were very disparate in their execution of many facets of genius, weren't they? With Jobs, when he came up with the cell phone, he basically combined a lot of features and benefits that you would like in one place, right? Now we have apps. Didn't it make all our lives more flowing, more fluid, more simple, and better? All of your businesses, all of your marketing is based on systems. There are average systems, there are great systems, and there are unique systems that are truly appreciated for being what they are and stand out. When I saw these systems, I wanted to organize that further and make it really simple. And basically it is, because all systems are really, if you think about it, composed of processes beneath them. And those processes beneath them are composed of elements. A are the elements, B are the processes, and they fit into the system. And if you start reorganizing your thinking along these lines, you can follow the path roads of genius. Everything is a system. There are electronic systems. There are weather systems. There are human systems. There's even more efficient systems to washing your hands. Everything is a system. You want to be an average ball player or a great ball player. You can study people and greatness and their execution and how they got there in any field. 
and then learn about that through this process of elements, processes, and systems. If you're doing hydroponics, if you want to come up with a better socket wrench, through trial and error, which is what Edison was very famous for, you can figure out the tension, the torso, et cetera, to create a more customized and more perfect system. I truly believe that we're all on the planet Earth because we do have a purpose, and our purpose is to perfect what's already in front of us and the systems that we operate in. And when we do that, we contribute to the world and we show how connected and interconnected we are. It's a nice idea, isn't it? There's a system to creating a more perfect acoustic guitar. There's a system, if you lack space, to improving on systems for bookcases and how you organize your books. In SEO, which I actually happen to do, and I've self-taught myself many things in many categories, as James and I were talking about. James, why don't you come up, have a seat, please. I'm pretty come shy. On. He's here to help me. <laughs> James is here to help me in case I stumble. By the way, this is my debut talk of this talk. So I don't know, how am I doing so far? Thank you, I really appreciate that. I'm debuting it because Colin is a wonderful person and James has offered to help me out here, so thank you again for being here. Um, it's an amazing guy, we had, we had some nice drinks together. Um, <laughs> but I, I mentioned that because I know James is very much into SEO and I said, James, you know, in perfecting the SEO system, is it really true? Because I believe it is. It's not about one big thing, it's about a lot of little things. Is it basically true, little things? Every single little step that you put into any system correlates to the one that comes next. So SEO, you start at the base, you build it up from there. Yeah, it's yeah. a staircase, and I'll go back to that. Correct. Um, so essentially, yes, and if you start recognizing and disciplining your mind to think in this new form, you start to get in the flow, and, and things come to you. You know about the creative process, you have this intuition and things, because you're in the flow. You're in this system of thinking. So, what happened here? Okay. Ah, so I wanted to delve deeper. What is this thing about creativity and creative genius? And these are probably familiar shapes to you. How many people recognize what these shapes really are? Anybody? Not a lot of people here. In fact, I don't think any, one person. Thank you, sir. Can you stand up? Would you be good enough to do that? What, what, what do they call this? Gentleman behind you, right behind you. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Okay. On the bottom right, I'm recognizing the flower of life, which is just all elements and electrons can be based off movements that look very similar to that. So. Thank you. Thank you for contributing. Um, give me a hand. All those shapes are actually known as sacred geometry. Sacred geometry. Um, the ancients that go back to the Egyptian mystery schools, the Library of Alexandria, up through the Greeks, all understood math as a fundamental building block and foundation of how to structure things and design. And, and so as they got more into this, they came up with what were called platonic solid, solids from Plato and um, all of these other shapes and forms. So the top row basically hinge off more structured shapes as you can see like from the, the triangle. Bottom row is particularly interesting to me. Um, those circles that interconnect, it's known as a vesica Pisces. You can always look that up when you get home or perhaps on your laptops right now. Um, it's symbolic of a number of things. Uh, when two circles are put on top of it, it creates a, uh, obviously this overlay and relationship between the circles. Uh, physicists have come to know this as descriptively the Big Bang. Uh, in your Old Testament, when God divided the waters from the waters, that might have been a mysterious line for you and you never really thought about that. But it is relational to how the physics of the universe continue to grow and expand. And as you take this into more complex forms and more circles, and the center point, of course, being the point where it all began, um, it builds up to the flower of life, which flowers and opens up into more circles, which I'll show you in a moment. But what's really interesting to me about this is that uh, Pythagoras understood this, and he started to see there was a relationship with the universe. And he thought it was so profound 
and it could lead to such powerful thinking that he actually banned it in, uh, in ancient Greece, and anyone who either studied this or practiced this was to be sentenced to death. So there was a lot of lost knowledge. Um, as you see, again, you have the flower of life in the upper left-hand corner, and as it continues to expand, these very decorative, interesting shapes are not quite clear what they stand for. But as you move forward on the bottom line, interestingly, if you see the spiral, does anyone recognize the pistils of a sunflower in that diagram? Yes? Well, you should. And more interestingly, as you move through the next one, which is actually further down, much further down the scale, but I didn't want to show you everything, that's actually how physicists look at a gravity well in space, wormhole. Okay, mathematically, diagrammatically plotted. Uh, the, last, <laughs> the last object here, revelations come to useless people. I felt pretty useless at the time. I didn't know what my passion or my purpose was. But that is actually, does anyone associate that with a, um, the, uh, what Buckminster Fuller created, which is the geodesic dome? How many people are familiar with geodesic domes, right? Now, just imagine if you were uh, familiar with this ancient wisdom and had been ahead of Buckminster Fuller. He didn't have to work very hard, did he, to come up with something ingenious that changed the world, made him a lot of money. I decided to go deeper than what I had already studied, and as I moved ahead in my learning, uh, I came up with probably the most profound concept and diagram of all. Up in the upper left-hand corner is a diagram that was stumbled upon by a really brilliant genius of the 14th century, Fibonacci. How many people have heard of Fibonacci? Oh my God, great, this is terrific. So this is gonna be fun. <laughs> so Fibonacci was initially, his, his, his task was to count the reproductive rate of rabbits. And, and, and he wanted to figure that out and how many rabbits were gonna start infesting his local village. And he stumbled into this amazing uh, understanding that if you take these integers and you take the last integer and you add it to the next integer and you keep doing this particular sequence and approach, that it could span out to infinity. But if you plotted it on a graph, that it formed this spiral. And if you broke it into sections in terms of where it was in these rectangles, it formed this pattern and this ratio that came out to 1.618. Now at the time, he was measuring the reproductive rate of rabbits. And then he started noticing that there were other things in nature that fit this exam ratio. What he didn't know at the time, because he never had a telescope, is that the same spiral curve is found in every galaxy in the universe. That's a spiral galaxy, but the ratio of all the planets in our solar system is exactly set with each planet set apart from each other from the distance, 1.618. There's a design to everything in nature. The ratio of the moon from the Earth to its center point is exactly 1.618. When you look at the spiral Superstorm Sandy, you all remember Superstorm Sandy a few years ago that struck the Northeast? 1.618. Every ocean wave that crashes on every beach that you've ever been at, 1.618. Every sea nautilus that's in that ocean, 1.618. It's known as the golden spiral. Now, we don't have to get into a philosophical or theological argument here, but it certainly seems like nature has a design that's repetitive. And all of these constructs are perfectly balanced, and they're beautiful. And it's, for me, a form of poetry. And this poetry speaks to me because it's basically saying, this is what you should aspire to in whatever you do in whatever system, including your business and marketing systems. There's a ratio, and it can be measured. If you go to the next level, if you look at a pleasing landscape, you will see it's particularly pleasing and resonating with you at a subliminal level because it fits into this diagrammatic construct. The pistils of the sunflower, that next view, if you ever look at a sunflower, you'll now look at it with fresh eyes. Snails that are in that landscape, spirals 
your thumbprint that identifies you as being unique in all the universe, you are. But it's built on a beautiful ratio, 1.618. When you bend your finger, guess what the curve measures out to? As a matter of fact, the curvature of your ear. It's the same. The human body is constructed if you measure your finger with the ratio of your arm, the ratio of your height. Guess how it plots out? And what's most interesting to me at all is, have you ever talked about seeing a really stunning woman or a really stunning man? Ladies, gentlemen? Well, if you're looking at their face, how closely or how far apart your eyes are set in proportion to where your eyebrows are and everything else set in your face, if you see a truly beautiful woman, the reason that we can all agree on the beauty subliminally, 1.618. Now, the ancient Greeks um, noticed this, and so Pythagoras, even though he kept this a secret, uh, it did get out, and when they built the Parthenon, you can see, if you're an architect and you really want to go to the next level, now you know how to do it. Da Vinci, of course, recognized it. It's known as the golden spiral, based on the golden ratio. And so the reason, one reason, subliminally, we can all agree that the Mona Lisa is a masterpiece is because he recognized this. In fact, that's not a perfect golden spiral. And since then, scientists have used this and applied it to studying great art. How many people want to be a great art or a graphic artist? Not just a good one. And what they found was that if you now can look at the, uh, some of his other works, such as The Last Supper, when you put, break it into these basic uh, uh, squares, I'm, I'm sorry, rectangles, uh, and then you apply the golden spiral, you'll see that's absolutely on point. Absolutely on point. Um, French Opera House designed a staircase. Um, if you're a photographer and you want to go to the next level, you need to make it your business to understand what's truly beautiful and how people perceive it. The American flag, believe it or not, based on 1.618, and actually uh, it doesn't really seem that mysterious to me because George Washington was one of the first Masons. The Masons had secret knowledge, right, passed down to them. And so Betsy Ross was in this small circle, this tribe of people. Um, the, the next uh, image over is Noel composition, famous Christmas carol. Want to write, want to write a great Christmas carol? 1.618. The notes and how they're arranged, the integers, and how people perceive that music. That's actually up for another purpose, which I'll bring you to later on. Um, when you go down, this uh, final line here, pretty profound stuff. Um, as uh, this was studied increasingly, there's a gentleman named Bernard Mendelbrot. And he was looking at economic models, and he wondered if the Fibonacci sequence applied to that as well. And he created fractals. This is an extension of taking this out to that almost inf infinite degree and devising this in a computer. It was designing all these designs that just went so far down the spectrum that he noticed that it definitely had a beautiful pattern and organization to it. And he wanted to know if it could apply to economic models. Just everything seemed to resonate, all these subjects. And he found that it did. And because of that, he won a Nobel Prize. But the most interesting facet of that for me is that how many people here are familiar with Forex trading? Okay, great. Forex trading is based on the work of Bernard Mendelbrot and fractals. And basically, it predicts that human behavior, even human behavior, if it's acting as it should, as a system, will operate on 1.618. You can predict the highs and the lows in the stock market and even political elections. In terms of design, it's been used subliminally in advertising. Twitter, for example, realized it. Even Donald Trump's head <laughs> is built on the Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> and you know why? Because he's a child of God like all of us are despite what you may think of his politics, whether you like him or hate him, because he's a product of the universe. I had all this now interesting knowledge in my head, and I didn't know what to do with it. 
because I still hadn't found my passion or my purpose, and it took me a number of years. In fact, I went through some odd jobs. You know, I stumbled through mediocre success. And then an interesting thing happened. Have you ever had it where your greatest setback becomes your greatest achievement? Have you heard that from people? 1996 was the culmination of everything in my life because it got to the point where I had lost my mother, lost my father, I have no brothers, no sisters, lost my grandmother, I had nobody. And I was actually sitting on the floor trying to figure out, not even really having a career, and being a little bit late in life here, that I needed to pull my act together and figure out what I was meant for. And I was literally sitting on the floor and I opened the LA Weekly, which I don't even really read, I happened to pick it up by accident at a newsstand. And the back page spoke to me, it said, Discover your passion, discover your purpose day. Come to the Lowe's Santa Monica Beach Hotel. Now, how's that for being in the flow and the golden spiral of design? Hmm? So I thought, gee, I, I probably should do this. And I showed up, and there were all kinds of amazing people pitching amazing opportunities involving nonprofit work, charitable work, public service work, and I still didn't know what, the, what it was, but it was resonating with me on a level like, you know, I, I could do this. I, I, liked, I liked that idea. George Stephanopoulos was at the time, I think, chief of staff for President Clinton, gave a keynote speech, and somebody stood up, asked him a question, and got, he got his respect. He was part of this club. I went up to the guy at the end who stood up and asked the question, and I said, uh, so what are you doing? What is this club? And he said to me, how would you like to party with the president? And I said, the president of what? And he said, the United States. And I said, is this a gag? And he said, no. And I said, so what are you talking about? And he said, well, President Clinton's coming to town, and you know, we're raising some money, and if you sell enough tickets, you get to meet him. And I said, seriously? He said, yeah, I've done it already. He showed me a picture with the president, and I thought, well, that's remarkable. And I said, yeah, I'm in. So as I thought about it, I said, well, now I've created a dilemma for myself because I've never really done fundraising, and I don't know if there's a system to that. But I thought if I thought a little bit about it, maybe I could come up with a system to raising money. And I know it must be possible because it's been applied to so many of these other areas. So like Einstein, I spent a lot of time thinking about the problem, a lot of time. And then I distilled it down to its simplest elements of the processes and the system. E equals MC square. Four little characters that represent an incre incredibly complex system that most of us still can't really fathom. Einstein's genius was to distill it down into four characters that explained it. So I said, I wonder if there's a fundraising system that I could come up with. And I did. And I figured out what are the elements that people can offer me if I call them, cold call. Well, one of them was money, which was precious and scarce, and they didn't want to necessarily part with it. The other was their time. They could volunteer, but it was precious and scarce, and they didn't necessarily want to part with it. But the third thing that they had were relationships with other people. And for some reason, when they didn't want to give me their money, and they didn't want to give me their time, they were more than happy to refer me to five people. It didn't cost them a lot. So I like to say that as far as relationship capital went, I became one of the richest political fundraisers in the 1996 presidential election because I became very rich in an unexpected way, a lot of relationship capital. When I called people cold call, I was no longer pushing betting or burgers. I was pushing the President of the United States, and I thought it'd be a simple sale. And I had, again, the, the brass to go through the phone book and figure out who were the most successful companies in healthcare or had agendas where they'd like to meet the President, right, and contribute and buy a ticket. So I cold called the CEOs and chairmen of healthcare companies, and the Secretary would say, oh, the President, and they'd get him on the phone. They'd get me on the phone with them right away. And I told him, he's coming to town, and perhaps you'd like to meet him, buy a ticket for yourself and your wife. And you know what they told me? Oh, is Bill coming back to town again? I enjoyed meeting him last month. 
Who's the entertainment? Uh, the entertainment? Yeah, who's the entertainment? Uh, it says Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, I love Whoopi. Put, put me down for two tickets. Or I don't like Whoopi at all, and we'll probably see him another time. But I tended to get rejected a lot, even trying to sell the President of the United States. So a lot of people are trying to figure out ways not to give me their money and not to give me their time. But they had lots of people in their network. So as a result, I became somebody who had huge relationship capital, and it led me to meet the President of the United States. In fact, I met him six times after that. And the reason was is because I knew all these people who hadn't yet met Bill Clinton, and they also wanted to give me their money. So as a result of that, um, I got to be pretty well known, and my career skyrocketed because I was looking at things from a different creative direction. It led me to get back, invited back to the White House, and now I went from these odd jobs to all of a sudden getting known in interesting circles by very impressive people. I know I was impressed. And when I was back at the White House, one of the people I had met said, hey, have you been down in the basement? And I said, the basement? I didn't know the White House had a basement. He said, yeah, there's something interesting down there. You should take a look at it. I said, yeah, I gotta go because like, I didn't know I had a basement. So in those days, because the security, it was before 9-11, you could have more opportunity to like give yourself a guided tour once you're in the inner circle there. And I went down to the basement, and of all things, I saw a gift shop, and it was run by the Secret Service. They had a benefit fund to raise money for injured and, uh, uh, agents who, and authors, those who've been killed in the line of duty. And I thought, you know, that's, that's a special cause. But they're sitting in the basement selling things from Air Force One on em emblems on jackets, you know, uh, and, and they had... Uh, folders with uh, the presidential seal on it and, and travel itinerary. That, in other words, if you wanted to go anywhere in the world when you had your travel master planner calendar, it had every hotel and it had every restaurant that uh, you know, someone of his stature would want to dine at. I'm thinking, you know, you, you could be selling this all over the world. And you can only sell it to people who work at the White House and people who are visiting the White House. And they said, we can? And I said, yes. It took me two years of knocking on their door to convince them that I could figure out a system of how to sell this stuff all over the world. Well, Secret Service agents are not the most trusting people. <laughs> and they had a, you know, show me attitude. And I'm not still even clear in my mind that I could pull this off. But I said, give me one item, your most successful item, and let me see if I can make it even more successful. So it so happened that they had a Christmas ornament they sold every year, very popular, that people would buy, and it was a different representation of the White House. And I said, give me that. Let's start with that. And they do, did. There was even dissension about that. It, that's why it took several years, but they finally agreed. So I thought, what would be the system to sell something that's already selling very well? It had to go to a theme, and it had to go to a theme that everyone would resonate with. And it had to be really simple, down, distilled down with simplest level of complexity, like all these geniuses that I've studied, and that is a fundamental precept for you folks. Always remember to distill everything down to its simplest level of complexity, right? And then I thought it had to resonate with the most massive audience, and it had to be something that everyone can agree on in terms of their patriotism. And it didn't take me long to come up with three words. Support our troops. Now, who's against that? So they put this Christmas ornament out, and it became their most popular seller in 15 years. So now they started to pay attention to me. It actually led to an eight-year relationship where I went on to raise, help them raise uh, gross, gross, I think, uh, several million dollars or more. Uh, I came up with interesting ideas that, like, you know, you want to smell like the president, come up with the fragrance. I came up with the idea of executive privileges. Uh, I was outvoted. They created something, a different line or name. We created apparel. Uh, it was a fun ride. But uh, that's what it led to. And then it led me to start thinking about branding. Because branding is really about distilling things down to the simplest level of complexity and making a statement that's dead on, bullseye, to represent you. Got milk? Right? Um, lose weight now, ask me how. Which, by the way, all great brands create intrigue. 
So don't forget that. They give you part of the puzzle, but they don't complete the puzzle. They invite you into the puzzle. It's all about storytelling. So if you're looking for branding for your companies, now you have an insight. Um, but it led me into other areas. So this was another product. Uh, I was involved with an environmental organization that was determined to rescue orangutans, endangered orangutans, from extinction. And they had a project that I thought was interesting that caught the quintessential element that I thought of what they were doing, which was they needed to raise, um, they wanted to save 560 hectares of rainforest, where this is just adjacent to the national park. And, and by preserving that, they would help to preserve the orangutan that could start to repopulate themselves. And that 560 hectares would cost a million dollars. So one thing I've always learned about, whenever you have what seems like an insurmountable goal, you need to break it down into its elements and its processes to create the system. So if you're planning to swim the English Channel, and it seems overwhelming, it is. But if you're planning to swim it stroke by stroke, and know where to apply what energies at what levels in terms of your physiology, you have a better than even chance, provided you've trained for it in the execution phase of accomplishing your goal. So the same principles applied here. So with Project 560 and raising a million dollars, it seemed overwhelming to that's very small nonprofit. But what I realized is if you got everybody engaged in the process and you broke it down into its components, uh, we might have a shot. So I had a relationship with this serial company, and I instantly saw the solution, because I started getting the flow of this kind of thinking. And you have a captive audience when you have a cereal box, don't you, in the morning? And kids are going to be eating this particular cereal. And so on the back of the box, I suggested Project 560, and essentially it's pretty simple, as all good things are simple, that they all have a goal of raising $560 through each of their classrooms. A tall order, but not a huge one. If you've got 30 students and you divide it by into three, 560, you get a manageable number. And then if you have a manageable process of how to reach your individual goal as part of the larger goal, and then you bring together in those $560 units with each of the classrooms out there, there's your million dollars. This program, by the way, I think ran for about six years. It was only supposed to go for a much shorter period. So, applying systems thinking, I had another client, and uh, actually he wasn't a client, he was somebody who I met at one of these events, just like now, and he was listening to someone on the stage, I was sitting in the back anonymously, and he came up to me, and he was very kind of, he was fascinated by how I looked at things, and he said, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, and I'm in a town, there's a lot of psychiatrists, uh, and, and, and I don't know how to compete, and I said, well, what's your passion, what's your purpose, he said, I just like to help people. I said, well, there's your solution. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, so I understand it, in the psychiatric field, you have a 50-minute hour. Why don't you give people an extra 10 minutes of your time? And you can be and stand out with your unique selling proposition as the home of the 60-minute hour. You think people appreciate you give them an extra 10 minutes of your time? But I'll lose customers the rest of the day, but you don't have enough customers, you're telling me, right? You still have slots to fill. So guess what? In two months, he was completely booked his entire week. And he was happy because he was really fulfilling his purpose and his patients were happy. They were giving him referrals and he didn't have the time for them. I started thinking about branding and reducing things to the simplest level of complexity. And this is more recent, but this is a fascinating word to me because everyone loves, to be, loves that word, honest. And I'm just going to show you in, by illustration, I didn't have anything to do with this, but in terms of analogizing, um, when you're thinking about your branding, your marketing, and how you really want to be effective in the world, and reducing things that are simplest level of complexity, think about words that represent you and that will connect with others. So honest is an interesting word because we all crave honesty. And how many people are familiar with the actress Jessica Alba? Have you seen her work? Okay, do you know that she's also involved with the Honest Company? So that's her baby. Not the baby she birthed, but the company she birthed, using the word honest, one word. And as you may know, she sells healthy family lifestyle child care products. It was founded as recently as 2012. People not only don't really know her as well as the word itself, although she's certainly helping to market and brand it, but that word led to a product that led to multiple products that people connected with. 
Connectin being the operative word. It's now graduated to over 100 products. 2016 sales were over $300 million since 2012. Okay? And she was recently offered $1.7 billion for one word, if you think about it in those terms. The power of words and connecting. It was around this time I had the good fortune in the golden spiral of my life as things started to pick up for me to meet Robert Allen. Uh, it was a chance encounter, but it was probably not a chance encounter. It seemed that way to me at the time. But I actually believe that we, our own lives are on the golden spiral, and if we're in the flow, we can follow through our passion and our purpose where we're supposed to go. And so, interestingly enough, um, he was about to go to speak on stage, and I said, uh, Mr. Allen, can I have your card? And most people at this level may, may not know this, have the card and the card. So he gave me the card, <laughs> and I didn't call him for six months, and then I called him, and I said, Mr. Allen, I met you six months ago. How many people think you need to know people in order to connect and get ahead in your career? I said, Mr. Allen, I met you six months ago. I spoke to you for three minutes, and he said, so why are you calling me now? And I said, because I didn't have anything to say to you six months ago, <laughs> but I do now, because it took me six months like Einstein spent, right, 55 minutes on the problem, to think of why we connected and how I can help you. And I've studied you, I've studied who you know, and I have five people in my network that I believe can help your business. So he's still suspicious because he doesn't know who the heck I am. And he says, well, send me an email. So I sent him an email with the five people and how and why they could connect him to people that could help his business. He called me back, he purred like a kitten. He said, Neil, this is very nice. And he invited me over to his home to meet him and his wife. And my short meeting lasted for three hours. And at the end of it all, he said, you know, I'm looking at your business card. It says, you're a business and marketing consultant. You're not a business and marketing consultant. I said, I'm not. He said, no, you're much more than that. You're a connector. And I said, what's that? Because I've been doing this effortlessly, being in the flow. And I had to go home on the internet and look it up. But it was that chance encounter that gave me my brand. Because now I had my passion and my purpose and I understood who I am. But I didn't know how to still apply it and there are many connectors who still don't, right? But I noticed I, there was this kind of flow that I was in and if I could put structure to connecting, that maybe I could monetize it. So I thanked him for that and it led to what a lot of you in this room have done, give a TED talk. And um, it did very well. I thought a lot about what I would say. I hadn't done a lot of pu public speaking at that point. In fact, I never saw that as anything uh, correlated with what I would do with my life. But the talk was on how to connect with anyone, anywhere, at any time, because I seem to have a gift for that. And I drew on, ironically, some of the things that you saw earlier. It was unanticipated, but there were corollaries that I began to see with the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That golden rule is expressed seven different ways in seven different of the world's great religions, and it all grew up independent of each other. They had no contact with each other. Do not harm, do any harm to others, as you would not want them to do harm to you. It seemed like it was a system of how to get along. And this is not what we all want. And if we get along with people, don't they want to buy from us? It's a relationship. And I started to see that we're not in trouble with transactions, we're involved with relationships. Everyone here, uh, I, I saw it earlier, I, I'm not as familiar as you are, but I see a lot of relationships going on here. There's a connectivity. So I started studying the laws of science, which you think would have nothing to do with this. And going back to the laws that I had studied, I noticed that there is a law of equivalent exchange. It states that you must first give up a thing of equal value before you can expect to give something back. So there's not only a system there, there's a sequence. If you want to create great connections in your life and have more business, there's a sequence. Most people want the order. Have you ever closed the sale before you've made it? So I also noticed Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction but that implies that in for order for anything to achieve a particular result, it must first initiate an equal action to achieve it, restated. And the other law 
is the law of conservation of mass, which comes from physics. In order to create anything of lasting value, all elements must first be in a state of equivalence. And that's also in chemistry. So that's a restatement in science of the golden rule. And guess what? The golden lesson is that according to the laws of chemistry, physics, and nature itself, one-sided relationships can never ultimately succeed. And James, what did we talk about earlier? Karma. Think about karma. It's in science. That is a scientific definition of the inescapable fact that karma is real. Now, we often don't see evidence of it because it's hidden and sometimes people tend to get away with things for a while. But eventually, we hear that things will catch up to them through karma. Well, you now can believe it. Karma is real, and it's part of the golden ratio. This led me to start thinking about things much more differently, and I concluded that, you know, really things are not about transactions at all. They're about relationships. Everything is in relation to each other, in physics, and chemistry, and people. And so if it's all about people, how do we create successful relationships, and what is the foundation of that? And it's trust, isn't it? How can you do business with people you don't trust? Inevitably, it will come back to bite you. And so in thinking about that, I thought, is there a system that I could come up with that can identify if someone's trustworthy 100% of the time, 100% accurately, in 100% of situations? Wouldn't you like to know if the woman you're about to marry is trustworthy? Meaning, <laughs> not just trustworthy, but digging deeper beneath that, dependable. The man that you're in a relationship with is dependable. You can always rely on him, or at least most of the time, because he's human. So in business, if we can't depend on each other, we're all in a link, a chain. And if the weakest link fails, the chain fails. So how do we know? How can we identify a system to know that someone is dependable? So the first set of principles I came up with in the system, again, is so simple. It's simple. Basically, identify the elements in trust. And I thought about this for three days because I took my 55 minutes to think about trust metaphorically. And you may add to this, but this is a real core nucleus of how to establish trust. Consistently, does the person you know show up? Do they follow up? Consistently keep their word? How important is that? And do they consistently behave in a reciprocal manner? Now, what is that really, go what is that really showing us when you delve deeper beneath that? Are they, do they have Habits that are dependable, that are consistent, not one time, and they smile, and they tell you what you want to hear. But this is who their core is. They really are. You have to watch them. You can't just instantly jump into bed with people. You have to see consistently how they show up. Do they consistently keep their word? That's a character component, right? And are they consistently behaving in a reciprocal manner? Okay, are they treating you the way you'd want to be treated, the golden rule? So, does the person you contemplate in a relationship with, do they, are they showing consistently good judgment, consistently good character, consistently good habits, and consistently good temperament? If you have somebody who has consistently good character, but their judgment is lousy, can you depend on them? If they have consistently good judgment and consistently good character, but their habits stink, and they never show up, and they flake out at the last moment, can you trust them? Confusing, isn't it? But when you break it down into the components, it's no longer confusing. And that's what I do, and it took me three days to come up with the obvious. Um, are they showing consistently good temper bit? If you have great judgment, great character, great habits, but they're bipolar, <laughs> right? Or they're borderline, or they're a narcissist. Can you trust them? So many of you heard the concept of having the four corners of the contract, right? Looking at the four corners of the contract. I like to look at the four corners of the person. This is a foolproof method that expands on what I've just spoken about. So essentially, you want to look at and observe everything a person says, and then everything they don't say. Because what they don't say will tell you just as much, if not more, than what they do say, and see how that lines up. Then you want to look at the execution side of everything they do and everything they don't do. Are they consistent? 
are all four corners of the person consistent? And I found that 95 times out of 100, people are not. Then the question is, to what degree? And then you actually, in your mind, understand just how much you can trust the person and whether you want to get it into business with them and what aspects you can trust and what not to trust so they can be supervised. No one's perfect, but now at least you have an understanding to how to measure their imperfections against your own standards and benchmarks of what you want to see in terms of employee and job performance. Interesting, huh? So how does this all line up consistently, the operative word? Now, I recently encountered some people. I tend to attract people that are pretty stable uh, because there is the law of the attraction. That actually goes to the Fibonacci <laughs> sequence, right? And, and we, we had a great, great few drinks and, and some time together. Now I know why I'm really up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so but, but then there are anomalous exceptions Borderlines, narcissists, sociopaths. How many people know that one out of 26 people in, the, in your life that you encounter is a sociopath? Wow, interesting. Well, congratulations. Have you had a lot of sociopaths that you've encountered? I used to work with lawyers. You what? <laughs> I used to work with lawyers. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, it's... it's, it's <laughs> okay. Moving right along. Moving right along. Um, it's important to realize that not everyone is going to live up to your expectations. And if you know that one out of 26 are a sociopath, how do you identify them? So sociopaths don't have empathy. I studied this for about three days. If they don't have empathy, it's going to affect their behavior. One of the reasons some people are excellent negotiators, they'll look you in the eye and they won't avert your gaze. I hate to think there's sociopaths in the audience because you're all nice people. But the law of averages is there may be one or two in here, right? But and you're in a negotiation with somebody who's really into their intellect and not into their emotions, right? That's a tell sign. It's just like playing poker. And so they won't avert your gaze, and particularly, uh, they have this very commanding approach because they want to establish dominance, right? That goes into dating and relationships. Uh, another interesting aspect of this is that sociopaths also don't get nervous under stress. So... That's, uh, that's another tell sign as well. And then there are other anomalies, and there are other behavior patterns. So this is one of the things that I found. Um, how many people know people who have ADD or ADHD? Sure. So I asked people who had this, and they told me that basically they tend to think circuitously in a circle, and they're stuck in a circle. So I asked them to create a system in their mind to visualize how to get out of that loop. And what I suggested is if they come up with the image of a pair of scissors and snip the circle. The circle, when it's stretched out, becomes a line. Most all of us are linear thinkers. If they want to get in the flow, they have to diagram, diagram it in their mind. And so if they stretch that out, and then it's sequencing, right? The most important things on that line should be at the head of the pack. And then the least important things, or the least pressing things, matters they have to take care of, should be further back. If they can organize, reorganize their thinking along those lines, it may help them. And sure enough, I've had a lot of friends who thank me for this, creating this little system for them. So connectivity is the new social commerce. And the, way I say that, the reason I say that is, is because we're all connected. Most people think in terms of marketing that uh, we have a funnel. You've taught about the funnel marketing system. But being a creative thinker, I thought about that too. And I decided to flip it. So I actually have the staircase marketing system where it's not flowing down from the top of the funnel into an increasingly narrow uh, 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 winnowing of elements. But what I do is I flip it. It's going from zero to hero. And you can go to bestseller status and whatever you're doing, if you're writing a book, you have a new product launch, whatever, by rethinking and reimagining that you're climbing up the staircase. And I ask my clients to do this. And when they're not really clear, this becomes a very clear diagram in their mind because they understand that they need to take certain steps, but they don't know the sequence. So I said, climb up the staircase. What step are you on? And they usually start talking about me uh, about step three when they're actually at, they're actually, you know, they think they're at step three and they're actually at step one, okay? So the idea here is to get clear in your mind, you know, where are you on the staircase? What steps you need to get to the top of the staircase, being the elements of the processes of the system to climb up the staircase, right? 
and then the precise sequence in which you need to take those steps and the special methods, approaches that you need to get you there as quickly, efficiently, and effectively as possible. And I work with a lot of people in this way, particularly authors. Sorry. So this is one of my clients right now. She wrote a book called Ren Women for Renaissance Women. I thought that's terrific a book that speaks to women who have multiple talents but very often aren't as con conscious or aware that either they have them or what to do with them. Sort of like where I was at one point. And, and so I wanted to help her. She sold 600 copies of this book. And I said to her, you know, if you want to sell more copies, you need to understand that you're in the flow with the universe and you're not even selling a book. You're selling a movement. And when everyone recognizes and sees that this is a movement, they can feel like they want to become empowered and be part of the movement. A lot of little girls are not uh, given a lot of reinforcement when they're young in particular. They're told, you can't do this, you need to be that, and role identification, all that, and their parents. I, I'm a very, very supportive person of, of women and, and underdogs everywhere. And that's actually one reason I wanted to come here today, uh, to help clarify things that I've learn. So I said to her, you know, create a movement. How do we create the movement? We're going to create a website, and we're going to bring people here who, for the first time, see that they're part of something. It's not just your book. And you will sell your book through this system. And they will be subscribing members, and they will tell their friends and tell their friends, and it will go viral. And we have specific processes and approaches with webinars and so forth that I've worked her, uh, included with my colleague, Michelle Price, who's a genius with social media marketing. A shout out to you, Michelle. Um, and, and she has a blue ocean strategy, meaning that you're not in competition with anyone. You're only in competition with you because every staircase is unique, isn't it? And you are your own staircase. So that's one example, and we're, we're taking off right now, and it's, this thing is expanding. Uh, this is my attorney, Kelly Bagla, and she came up with a system. I thought it was pretty ingenious. Uh, it's basically the legal life cycle of your business and how to protect it. And essentially, she broke it down into the elements of startup, growth, mature, sale of business, the end stage. And so it's her system. Those are the elements and then the processes. I'd encourage you to check her out because um, she is now known as the queen of business law. And she's speaking on stages uh, and will be shortly. But it, uh, what I wanted to say was the point is that the way we are uh, getting her off the ground on her marketing staircase is that we're starting out with a press release now, most people think press releases are designed for sales. I said, no, it's designed for branding. Uh, I work with a service that can get you on 500 major media sites, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News. It's, and, and it really doesn't get you sales, but it gets you branding. And so one of the things I suggested is that in part of that, it's guaranteed that she'll get on Fox uh, 11 in New Orleans. She lives in San Diego. I live in San Diego. And I said, so let's put this as the first step. The second step is I call the stations, including Fox in San Diego, and I said, you know, she's been noted, she's been uh, lauded here, or she's been featured, rather, on, on Fox 11 in New Orleans. Why isn't anyone in San Diego taking notice of this? Because she's here in San Diego, right? So you start walking up the staircase of publicity, which interoperates with the staircase of sales, which interoperates with getting more publicity, which interoperates with getting more sales. See how that works? And, and so you do this in sequencing. Um, and, and very interestingly, one of the subcomponents of this, if you want to be a successful author, the two elements that you really wouldn't need to pay attention to are not just newsworthiness, but relevance, because that's how your audience in the newsroom is thinking about this, right? They're making decisions. They want to know that your book is not only newsworthy, but it's relevant. It can't be one or the other. It's got to be both, okay? Um, increasingly, in my own golden spiral, I've been stepping up, and so... I was approached by somebody who has a social network for geniuses. How about that? So I'm helping him by crystallizing how this whole process can work and, and having a staircase, a marketing staircase to move this thing out. And it's growing great. A lot of geniuses, you know, are, tend to be introverted people. We're going to have them co-create. And the sum will be greater than its parts. And some really ingenious ideas that will come out of this will probably spawn some of the next great inventions and things. Um, I have a colleague who's retained me because he knows I'm a connector and he's come up with a referral marketing system. So how many people like to get more referrals, right? Expand your business. So he has that. 
He spent millions of dollars figuring out how to do a referral system that will help you build your brand, improve your communication and connectivity skills. And actually, he's no longer in 107 countries. He's now in over 130. In six months, the proof of concept is he went from a soft launch, uh, no sales, where he's now growing an average of 33% a month. And he's in these many countries. I think I checked his Alexa ranking of his popularity. And it's somewhere down like 120,000th most visited site in the world. So I'll have an offer for you later that will include this ability to tap into this resource. Expanding up the golden spiral in terms of my life, this woman approached me with a really interesting idea. Um, how would you like to be part, how many people here are involved with real estate? Real estate's your business, and you're hunting, for pros you're hunting and prospecting for the perfect property, cap rate, right? Return on investment, you're penciling out. You have a system for prospecting where it's just so perfect that you know, you're just off the charts and getting all the housing that you've always wanted, just meeting all your criteria? Probably not. Uh, I've never really met people in real estate who are thinking about it in terms of the demand curve side and, and what that's solving that problem. So here's a woman who thought about it from the other side of the equation. Here's what I mean. She saw a problem in the marketplace, had nothing to do with real estate, but that solopreneurial women who like to work at home, stay with the children, um, have to commute and leave their children behind. That's a problem. And then there's child care and expenses. The simplified solution is stay at home, be a stay-at-home mom, live upstairs, and your workplace is downstairs. We'll rehab that property and turn it into your workplace. And we will provide computers, and we will provide a conference room, and people could come to you in a nice home and a nice cul-de-sac that sort of looks like it's a workspace, but sort of looks like a home. And uh, it basically transforms the whole economy because now people don't have to commute in those long distances and you have cities growing to 30 million in population and two hour commutes and you're exhausted and you're not in a good mood. It enhances your life. 87% of business women work from home. They work at home 103% growth since 2005. She's following the demand curve and creating a housing market that could be basically expanded into a billion dollar business just by solving a problem and refocusing where that problem really is. And that's the company, homework. How would you like not just to get involved with solving a transportation issue, but reorganizing entire communities and how they can live and interoperate and connect with each other? Well, I'm involved with that. Have another group of people that are looking to raise money around Delphi Village, they're going to buy the entire town south of Las Vegas and reorganize that into a system that will allow people to flourish and interoperate in a lot more pleasing manner. Um, and it will be a retreat center, a wellness center and spa. They're looking at this like a permanent burning man 50 miles south of Las Vegas. They will have eco-friendly technologies they will demonstrate and license while they're putting on concerts and entertainment festivals. Right? And those festivals will draw 50 miles away from Las Vegas with conventions constantly going on, with women, particularly who are bored with their husbands going to the latest rodeo convention and don't really know what to do with themselves, and they'll create specially defined entertainment for them. And when they have uh, shows like the uh, Consumer Electronics Expo, and they're showcasing all the latest theories, they'll have ready demonstrable and licensable proven technologies that you can come 50 miles south to look at yourself and, and make money from that profit center. Um, so as you can see, they're gonna have some real innovations in integrating that into a whole new type of community and community of th people thinking. They'll even have the world's first fly-in movie theater. People have light planes in the area. And they have all these other innovations to make this a really fun experience. Um, Up-leveling further, Here's a, uh, a friend of mine, anyone in agriculture, agricultural land? Well, she has a solution now that can basically uh, sustain the planet and grow more crops with greater yield. She also has a solution to disassemble toxic and plastic, uh, plastic materials in the world's oceans to reclaim the oceans. And she's come to me to get involved with this particular project. In fact, she has a project that can restore the world's coral reefs, which are dying. If the coral reefs go, you probably know if you go up the eco chain, we all go. We're all interdependent. We all connect. So she has that solution. Now I'm involved with that. Pretty good for a guy who's pushing burgers and bedding. 
<laughs> but with all these innovations, we still need to connect people to these solutions, because like you, many people are not aware of them, and they exist. So these folks came to me, and they have a theater in the round, and it's a complete sensory experience that'll blow you away. It involves virtual reality, and basically you don't have to wear the glasses. You can sit in the audience in this theater around like experience, like an IMAX experience, and it's immersive, and you can tell the story all around you, and in addition, it goes beyond your five senses, where imagination becomes reality. They have a live philharmonic, state-of-the-art integration, integration being the operative word, of all these technologies, just like Steve Jobs saw that with your cell phone. And you'll have this 3D projection, and you will have fish that can swim up to you right in front of your nose and then swim away, and you are in this whole new experience that will spread the gospel of the possible. And I'm involved with that. Um, so it's pretty amazing. This will appeal to all ages. They plan to have 2,000 people, and guess what? It could be really profitable, we found, in month 10. And unlike Cirque du Soleil, where you have all this infrastructure you have to pay for and all the performers, this is all done with a projection, all in a computer disk that can be licensed for millions and millions of dollars to save people even more millions of dollars around the world. But why stop there? Why not just connect us to our future? So, sorry. Uh, this is my friend John Spencer. He's the founder and president of the International Space Tourism Society. I met him because I was bored one day and I wanted to go to a talk, just like we are here. And I thought, this is a very intellectually ingenious person. I'd like to get to understand him better. He's now become one of my best friends. I love the man. He's such an innovative person. And he came up 10 years ago with the idea of Mars World, because Mars is going to become an increasing brand as we go. So he created Mars World Hotel and Casino. It's a $1.8 billion project. China just offered him a billion dollar LOI for the land. It was supposed to originally start in Las Vegas. Um, he's also been offered $400 million for the build out. He needs $400 million to go, and he believes he may be getting that by November, December. With that money, he'll take $250 million, hire 1,000 people in LA, create a lot of new jobs. And uh, I've been gratified to say he wants me as part of one of his senior team members to shepherd all these different facets. And uh, so basically, uh, he will be creating a pathway for everyone to understand the future and inspire people to do so. Uh, of course, he draws on ancient wisdom and knowledge. You recognize the geodesic dome. It's going to be the largest in North America, maybe the largest in China. Four Rose Bowls can fit in it. In terms of traffic flow, he drew on other geniuses like Walt Disney who really understood that if you go in a circle, it, it, it will enhance the ability to also cross-functionally get across different lands, adventure land, future land, right? So that's the model. And the outer ring will be the mall, where everyone can do the shopping. The innermost piece, right, is the hotel, 200 people. And everyone can get there cross-functionally. And so he's made all these innovations based on the, base, the basic uh, diagrammatic uh, uh, diagrams that I showed you involving uh, the golden ratio. Um, and if you want to go out and understand the future, you can even walk out in the center of uh, Mars World and take a Mars walk, right? And get familiar with what it's going to be like for all of us when we go eventually. And of course, we'll have shows and events, and they'll all be about the future, and we'll be imagining how we interoperate in that next dimension uh, as we move forward on our timeline. So why stop there? I'm sitting in an inventor's convention, much like yourselves, and a guy was, I was pointed out to people in the audience, a guy turned around to me and he said, uh, you have a card? I said, no. I actually <laughs> try to make myself a little bit scarce because I'm overwhelmed, as you can see right now, with some amazing things. Nonetheless, he said, well, I have a card. He handed it to me, and I nearly fell out of my chair. And that is actually, because I didn't have anything else to depict at the moment, I'm doing this on the fly, what he handed me, the top part of his card, gravimetric space drive, the force. And when I saw gravimetric, I nearly fell out of my chair because when I was in college, I was reading a lot about gravity, gravity waves, physics, remember, all the ancients, and um, studying the, uh, the golden ratio and that gravity well. And I said, is that your propulsion system? And he said, yes. I said, we need to go to the men's room. So we never went back into the conference. I didn't stay in the men's room with him too long. <laughs>
But we got to talking, and I said, oh, my God, so you've looked something I thought about. And when I told him what I had thought about, he said, oh, my God, I've never met anyone who's, like, thought this way. He had this secret in his head for 20 years. Turns out he was with NASA, and he was going to let it die with him, essentially, because he just didn't feel like the, the push to do it. And I said, well, if this is real, you cannot let this go. So I actually invited him to lunch, and I tested him. And I said, I'm here to determine if you're eccentric. And I'm letting you know up front, because I'm always honest with people. So I need to ask you a series of questions, what I did. And I said, you know, this has the ring of truth to it, but I still can't believe it. So I introduced him to a patent attorney. I said, I will need you to prove to me this guy is eccentric, because I have too much on my plate. And he had eight meetings with him. Next week, we're going to file the patent. So he can get us off the planet. He claims if you scale up the system that he's come up with at half the speed of light. So here's an interesting diagram. This is actually the Cassini mission that went to Saturn. And if you see the curve, does that resonate with you? Now, here's what's so fascinating about it. If you want to look deeply, this is where the planets lined up. And because of the gravity of Saturn, I'm sorry, Jupiter, it was used as a propellant to then boost the orbit to get to Jupiter in like six years. Well, now this is a game changer, isn't it? So the system, if you kind of recognize that if you're looking from the top down, remember when I gave you the diagram about a gravity well? This is not our diagram, by the way. I couldn't give you the secrets, but this is something that's similar to it. And this is the speed of light. This is how long it would take to get from the Earth to the moon, to the sun, to Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest star, 4.4 light years. Um, this is recently discovered last week. This is Tau City. It's one of our nearest stars. It's uh, about 12 light years away. And as you can see, they just found through the Kepler telescope, and Kepler was playing around with sacred geometry. A nice little metaphor of how this all came around. With uh, Tau Ceti F, which is, as you can see, pretty closely aligned where Earth is, and they're both similar stars with similar radiuses and, and similar light output. So this is actually a great object of, worthy of explanation, uh, exploration. But the most interesting part here is that that would have been unachievable by our, our former standards. Now, if this system proves out, we can get there in 24 years, in our lifetimes. It's a game changer. Uh, the TRAPPIST system recently discovered is actually about 40 light years away. That means we can get there in eight years, and they found five potential habitable planets. As you can see, G is pretty much lined up where the Earth is, um, but actually F, E, and F, I think, are the closest in terms of size. There's a number of obstacles we have to solve in terms of the size of the planet, gravity, etc., and distance from the sun if there, it's in the Goldilocks zone, as they say, the habitable system. Um, and, and so we also found it in Kepler, the Kepler system. And these are all the potential habitable exoplanets. I happen to know Dr. Mae Jemison through a conference I ran. She's in charge of the 100-year Starship Project. And essentially, her job is to get us off the planet and populate another star system in 100 years. I'm looking forward to giving her a call in a few weeks. I actually had the great fortune to meet uh, Buzz Aldrin. He was asking for my support in licensing and marketing some of his spaceship designs. I'm looking forward to giving him a call again in the future. So scaling up even further, somebody came to me and they had a chip. It's a data chip that's 13 times ahead of what he believes uh, uh, the, is currently exists with Intel, their finest chip, 13 years ahead. And it's faster, it's more economical, it will save energy. It's a $4 trillion market and for me helping him to connect him to the right people, he offered me graciously 5% of his company. Okay? That 5%, and I believe that it will take off, and this can be a multi-billion dollar company. I just introduced him to somebody I was connected with who is connected to Bill Gates, has nine patents with Bill Gates, and that person now has just authenticated his technology and decided to put his reputation on the line and join his board, which is leading to a lot of funding opportunities. But with my share, I hope to go back and help get us off the planet and invest in that opportunity. So I'm going to end off with this. I like to help people, I like to connect people. I have a friend who's nominated for a Grammy Award, studied under Quincy Jones. There's a producer who's producing the 30th anniversary album tribute to 
Michael Jackson's We Are the World, last year, 2016. And he also studied under Quincy Jones. I just thought it'd be a nice gesture to connect them. Of course, the universe has other ideas in store for us. And in this case, uh, the producer was sitting there listening to my voice, and he said, you know, I'm listening to the quality of your voice. You're an alto baritone, aren't you? I said, what? He said, you're an alto baritone. I said, no, I, I've never studied singing or anything like that at all. And he said, well, I think you can sing. You want to go in the booth, and I'd like to listen to you. So I said, you know, you're a glutton for punishment. I only sing in the shower, right? So I did, and I did okay. And then, and then, I'd like to ask a question of everybody in the audience. How many people realize it's Christmas in August? Is it Christmas in August? It's Christmas in August. How many of you people like to sing Christmas carols? Anybody? Okay. Any of you really good at swing, singing Christmas carols? Really, really good? Could you stand up? <laughs> Thank you. What is your name, ma'am? John Carson. What is it? John Carson. Don. Do you like to sing Noel? Sure. Can, can you sing just one <laughs> stanza for me? Noel, Noel. Can you sing that for me? Okay. Noel, Noel. Thank you. No That's it. Can we give her a hand? <laughs> Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Who else likes to sing Noel? Who else? You, ma'am. Oh, well, let's see. Somebody who's a little closer to the mic. Can, can, we, can we get somebody closer to the mic? Okay. How about the lady in the back? Can we get to her? Okay. We're going to have to wrap this up because I actually may be running out of time and I want to give you a really special offer here. But uh, could you, what is your name? Celeste. Hi, Celeste. Could you sing that one stanza of Noel? Sure. Noel, Noel. Perfect. Thank you. Can I ask everybody in the audience to do me a favor? Can you all stand up? Thank you. Can you all please now join together, because it's Christmas in August, and sing that one stanza, just that one, of Noel. Ready? One, two, three. Perfect. You guys need to go on the road. You have a second <laughs> profession ahead of you. All right. Thank you. You've been a great audience. If you could sit down. Would you all like to hear how I sing Noel? Yes. Because the connection I made allowed me to have a special experience. We are one, we are one, we are one, we are one. Now, I actually didn't do that, that great, but do you see the sort of the connection there? We are one. Okay, I was actually in the wrong key, but Maestro, could you hit it? We are one race, we are one people, we are one nation under one God. We have one purpose that we love one another. He said love one another, he said love one another. We are one, 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 we are one. Okay, so that's a song. That's actually how I executed it. I was not that proud of myself, but that is the version they recorded. Uh, this is a song that has 700 of the world's leading major music artists. Uh, it is on the 30th anniversary of Michael Jackson's We Are the World. Uh, they have Frida Payne, they have the Platters, the Pointer Sisters, and now me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask for it. Now, how did I do that? Because I reflected back on the Fibonacci sequence and Noel. And I recognized the pattern, and that led me to crystallize my ability to harmonize and stay on message. And as a result, I got this offer. This is a text I got five days later from uh, David Longoria. He has 52 produced gold and silver, I'm sorry, gold and, and platinum albums to his credit. And he said, good job in the studio, Neil. I finally got to cut the voices in, and you sounded good. Maybe we will win a Grammy together on this one. 
Next uh, text, I've fallen off my chair. Let's get out there and change the world. How many people want to change the world? Change the world, okay? So if, if we do get a Grammy, you'll share in it too with no musical training. That would be bad. And then he goes on to offer me the opportunity to sing more and get into movies and TV shows. And here's my point. And this is the point of everything. By understanding these principles and tying them all together, you see how they support all systems. You know, there are graphic artists who want to become greater graphic artists and they have their system. There are photographers who have a system. There are architects. There are businesses. There are marketing people out in the audience today. They all want to have a better system. So these principles work in whatever discipline, whatever area that you operate in. And I may be going to get a Grammy Award, having no musical training. I don't know if that's a first in history. There's 700 major artists. It's a, it's a uh, Guinness Book of World Record. And I'm involved with them. So my life, starting out pushing burgers and betting, has led me to meet extraordinary people by having this knowledge. Uh, here's me with Nobel Peace Prize winner Desmond Tutu. Uh, I was invited to get involved with having the privilege of launching the uh, first Shanghai International Medical Research Zone, bringing people all over the world to solve medical problems through new treatment. Um, I've had the great privilege of beating the former president of India when I executive produced the 32nd Annual National Space Society Conference. I can learn now in one week what it takes most people to learn in a year. I've learned many, many subjects. And I'm very perfectionistic, and you can be too. And this can happen to you, because you saw my intelligence test. I personally put it up there, show you I am not extraordinary. Pretty smart, but not extraordinary. There's me being offered knighthood two years ago. I turned it down. Sir Neil Sperling doesn't have a ring to it. It's like Sir Jerry Seinfeld, right? <laughs> Sir Manny Moe and Jack, you know? Sir Larry Curley and Moe, doesn't work. But uh, I love to help people, and I know where I started, and you know, crystallizing your thinking can lead you to extraordinary, unexpected results as it did to me. We're all connected. We all have our own golden spiral in our lives. Many of us do not live up to our full potential because we don't see how to understand and how to access. And that's the benefit of wisdom that you can practice and repeat that can change your life, hopefully the way it changed mine. I want to thank you very much. You've been an amazing audience, and I appreciate everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Let's Thank get you, you back much. in the middle, Neil. Thank you. Let's get you back in the middle. I'm uh, trying to get the contact page up back up, and I, I skipped over okay. that. They want to get a hold of me. I'm not sure how I get out of this particular. They'll sort it out. Okay. Thank you. Cool, cool. Thank you very much. You're very, very welcome. Thank you very much. Give Thank another you. round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank I have you. a gift for you as well. Oh, okay. Beautiful. Is this oh. one intelligent guy? Yeah. Holy moly. Super, super smart. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for coming and you know, blessing our students with your brilliance, your intelligence, what have you. And you know, everything's linked. Everyone, everything's the, the, interconnected. The blessing is in the reciprocity. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful.